Well, thank you very much. And I want to um, thank both of the organisers for persuading me to come and talk. This is the first time I will have given a talk that's not in my own academic field. So this is personal family history. Um, so it's a bit strange for me, but anyway, I saw this is a, a first, uh, first go. And also to Vivian Perutz for putting me in touch with the organisers. So um, I should say, I've called this Two Pathways to Strangeways. Both my parents worked at the Strangeways Research Laboratory. This is a, in case you don't know, it's not part of the university. It still exists at the very end of Hills Road in Wirt's Causeway. And it, it's funded through, well, I think all the staff there are funded by different sort of fellowships or organisations. So it's, well, it used to be cobbled together forms of funding. And now I think it's the arthritis, won't be research council, but it's, it's, it's mainly devoted to arthritis research, although it used to be much more general. So uh, m my parents, Alfred Glucksmann and Ilse Lesnitsky, were both refugees from Nazi Germany. My father arrived at the Strangeways Laboratory in 1933 when he was 28, and my mother came five years later in 1938 when she was 29. And they both remained working there until retirement in 1970 and 1978, 1988, sorry, respectively. Um, so what I'm going to do is really focus on their two very different trajectories in coming to Cambridge, and it's a very short talk. Um, I've, I've focused, i followed the brief strictly, 1933 to 1945, Cambridge, refugees, scholars, so I saw that's, that's what it will be. Um, Alfred Glucksmann had studied medicine at Heidelberg University, and by the early 1930s, he was a lecturer in anatomy, and his research field was um, developmental cell biology. In early 1933, uh, after Hitler came to power, he was summarily dismissed from his job, and I don't know how the connection with, the, with Cambridge was established, um, but it was facilitated by the SPSL, which must at that time still have been the AAC. I haven't been to the archive and looked up his file, but it probably explains there how the connection um, was, was made. Um, he arrived in Cambridge in August 1933, thinking he would be staying for a maximum of two years, by which time Hitler would have gone. But in fact, he only went back to Germany twice, once soon after the war on a government-sponsored fact-finding investigation of the state of medicine in post-war Germany, and again in the early 1960s to a conference. On, on both occasions, he visited his former boss in Heidelberg, who was still the director of the, or who became again director of the Anatomy Institute, um, but had been dismissed during the Hitler regime because his wife was half Jewish. But Alfred, my father's parents, didn't survive the Holocaust. They were killed, as I've recently discovered, in Auschwitz, uh, near where they lived in Upper Silesia, rather than dying in Theresienstadt of illness, as he believed, right to the end. So he arrived in Harwich on the 15th of August, and he travelled the following day to Cambridge. And he... This, yes. So um, he wrote, he, I have three diaries of his which are all written in this tiny little, tiny little writing and it's all in German and I don't understand German anyway. <laughs> and there's one entry that is in, in, is in English and that was soon after he had arrived. So he arrived in Harwich on the 15th of August and he travelled the following day to Cambridge and the sole this entry um, suggests the gloom that descended on his arrival. He must have been able to read and write a certain amount, but he couldn't speak. So he said, the 16th, I arrived in England. When the train approached the station, I was disappointed. It is a large, low town in a plain region, i.e. meaning flat. Um, 
The railway station is very ugly and dirty. The thought to live two years in this town was terrible. <laughs> the next day, I went to the Stranger Ways Research Laboratory on invitation of Dr. Fell, my new chief. I found a young and nice lady who does not speak one word German. Well, there's no reason really why she should. Um, I found her very congenial, but the laboratory has only young people. The eldest of them is just 30 years. I was afraid that I receive only a little microscope, <coughs> but I'm glad that Miss Fell gave me a good binocular from Zeiss. I do not know if I'm reta to retain this instrument because I could not understand all what she talked, i.e. <laughs> said. Um, he also recalled that when he turned up at the lab at 8 a.m. the next day, there was nobody nobody there yet because they all started much later than he was used to and soon after his arrival the whole staff disappeared on holiday leaving him space to get on with writing a paper he was soon joined by another refugee um, Werner Jakobsen whom he had known in Heidelberg previously and clearly Miss Fell I will refer to her as Miss Fell although she became Dame Honor Fell but throughout my childhood she was known as Miss Fell. All the, all the male scientists were just called by their surname but um, she was called Miss Fell. Anyway, Miss Fell obviously went out of her way to create a haven for refugee scientists, presumably liaising with the SPSL and other funding organisations as well as with the, with the Home Office in order to support them financially and secure entry papers. So for the first couple of years, um, Alfred lodged with a family living somewhere close to Queen Edith's Way, and the father was a milkman, and the housewife wife cooked all his meals. And he later regretted having told her that he liked salami because she went out of her way to find, quote, foreign sausage, and she fed it to him every day. And of course, in those days, it wasn't proper, proper salami. Um, by the outbreak of war in 1939, he must have accommodated to the idea of living in Cambridge for the long, or at least for the, for the medium term. He'd moved into a flat of his own. He had a wide circle of friends, both British and refu other refugees. He frequently, um, he regularly frequented the Panton Arms pub, which still exists um, in Panton Street. And of course he'd Learned the, learned the language. So that is a photo of him um, in his lab with his microscope. Um, it's the only photo I could find where he's not got a pipe in his mouth. And that is the back of the strange ways. Um, there's this, that was his office there. And there are many photos taken on that um, sort of terrace area later. But on May the, May the 12th, 1940, along with many others in Cambridge and elsewhere, he was arrested and eventually um, interned on the Isle of Man as part of Churchill's draconian collar the lot uh, policy at the time of the German invasion of France. There's a, I mean, a lot of literature, and other people have talked about internment, and there's a lot of literature on the ignorance of the British authorities and the inability to distinguish between refugees and prisoners of war. Uh, two, year, two months after um, being in the uh, Isle of Man, he was deported to Canada on the Sobieski, a po former Polish liner. And luckily he hadn't been on the previous convoy, the Arundora Star, which was torpedoed by German U-boats with a great loss of life. And from Newfoundland, he was sent to Quebec, where again conditions were less than basic, but where the Canadian officials seemed to be better informed than the, um, than, than the British. Both on the boat and in the Canadian camps, Jewish refugees and Nazi prisoners of war were kept close together. The, the uh, sailors weren't able to distinguish between them, but of course they distinguished between each other. And I clearly recall my father talking about the fights that there were on board and how they nearly killed each other. In fact, there were some murders in the Canadian camps and the correspondence from the, one of the Canadian commandants, he says that one of the Nazis was 
if not two of the Nazis were murdered by the um, Jewish refugees. His release and return from Canada in September was engineered by um, Miss Fell and colleagues from the lab who, with the support of the SPSL, persuaded a local MP in Cambridge, a Mr Pickthorn, to ask a question in the House of Commons criticising <coughs> the arrest of scientists who were doing important research on wound healing as part of the war effort, which is what he was doing then. And that intervention had the desired effect and he returned in September. However, during the return voyage, he was led to believe that he would be sent back to Germany as part of an exchange with German prisoners of war. It seems as if total chaos reigned sort of between the officers of different ranks and um, on the boats. So um, luckily that didn't happen and he instead had to take several boys from Gordonston School back to Gordonston before he could come back to Cambridge. Uh, his diary reveals, this is his internment diary, he wrote a diary while he was in internment. His diary reveals his relief at returning to Cambridge and his appreciation when he realised that many of his colleagues and friends had worked tirelessly behind the scenes for his release. And ironically, I suspect that it was as a result of that experience that he uh, began to think of Cambridge as his home. After his return, he was asked by Lord Beveridge to write a report to be used in the parliamentary campaign to end the policy of internment that was led by the MP Eleanor Rathburn, the feminist um, social welfare MP. A summary of the report was later published in Beveridge's book in praise of freedom and my father took a leading part in the in that campaign organizing meetings in Cambridge and doing what he could to get others released and sending um, news of people who were still interned to the relatives who were here and in all of that he was I mean, worked with the Cambridge refugee committee and mentions Esther Simpson, who's already been, whose name's been mentioned several times of the SPSL, and Gisela Peiser, who was to become Gisela Perutz, who was their mother. <laughs> um, so I've inherited a substantial file of documents and letters dating from this period, including letters to my father from Beveridge, Rathbone, C.P. Snow and Keynes, including the one that was shown yesterday, many of them handwritten, pertaining to the campaign and to request to get particular internees released, um, including Kurt Jos. There are also numerous letters from people still interned begging him to intercede on their behalf. And significantly, perhaps, and I think somebody mentioned this yesterday, many of the writers emphasised their belief in the importance of personal influence in the UK and the power of social networks so that getting released would depend on basically string pulling, not to, I mean, that somebody who knew somebody or somebody who'd, who'd got influence. And I think that seemed to be a fairly widespread view of how things worked in England that was shared by Central European refugees. Soon after his arrival, my father wrote in his, um, well, remarked in his diary that making a career in science in England appeared to depend on who you knew rather than on how good a scientist you were. So he, my parents got married soon after his release in 1940 and my impression of their life in Cambridge for the remainder of the war was that despite I mean, many privations and restrictions on travel and the compulsory weekly registration at the police station in St Andrews Street, that's where the main post office is now, there was a lively, or well, had been, unless that's been moved as well, uh, there was a lively social, cultural and intellectual life shared with the many refugees and other academics and scientists who were evacuated from Cambridge, from London to Cambridge, um, as well as from welcoming Cambridge residents. As he wrote at the end of his internment diary, I owe to the internment not, e not only meeting interesting and valuable people and new friendships, but also a feeling of liberation. I learned to see my fate in proportion and realised how much of it is linked with a certain group of people. <coughs> Nobody can jump over his own shadow and there is no sense to deny one's origins. 
in the words of the old slogan, I don't know what slogan that is, it must be a German one, we cannot become blonde, and being dark, although he wasn't exactly very dark, um, as such is no sign of inferiority or weakness. Therefore, it makes no sense to become completely assimilated in England, and it seems that our attitude to England will always be influenced by our German upbringing and linked to our Jewish fate. My mother had translated that from his German, so I don't really know how accurate it is, but anyway. But in other words, coming, it was the sort of coming to terms both with himself and with his permanently sort of outsider <coughs> refugee status in England. So in 1946, he was naturalised as British citizen. He continued his research on developmental cell biology, especially in relation to cancer, and he collaborated with colleagues around the world, particularly the US. Um, fairly soon after the war, he had already published what um, came to be recognised later as a groundbreaking piece of research on uh, what he called programmed cell death, or it was later known as apoptosis, which is instead of looking at cell proliferation as the, as the basis of cancer, look, looking at how cells die in a programmed way as a sort of different way of looking at it. Anyway, this, um, uh, I'm not going to say it fell on totally deaf ears, but it wasn't really taken up until 20 years later, and then it became a very major area of um, research. He's, he, he was appointed a senior Gibb Fellow and was supported by the Cancer Research Campaign for many decades and served as Deputy Director of the um, Strange Ways Lab until 1970. And after retirement, he researched a book on, uh, well, wrote, published a book on sexual dimorphism, which is sort of sex differences, physiological, <coughs> apart from the obvious ones, um, with the support of the Leverhulme Emeritus Award. And he worked at the um, Babraham Agricultural Research Institute that was also mentioned earlier. So my father had had a classical humanist education in Germany, and he retained a lifelong interest in philosophy, art history, and music, or what might be called high culture, um, while being relatively uninvolved in politics, or active politics. My mother was very different. I'm turning to her now. She grew up in Berlin um, during the Weimar years, where she enjoyed contemporary theatre, film, and literature. She regularly saw Einstein coming out of the U-Bahn as she was going into the U-Bahn, and she went to uh, lectures by Wilhelm Reich. In the 60s, when I was involved in the women's movement, 60s and 70s, there was nothing I could do or say or think about that she hadn't already done in the, 19, <laughs> in the 1920s, which was very frustrating, as you can imagine. So um, in, in the early 1930s, while she was a medical student in Berlin, she was an active member of the anti-fascist Rote Studenten Group, the Red Student Group, attending political meetings, wearing an Antifa, I think it's pronounced, a badge. She distributed leaflets in working class areas and she went on demonstrations. And in April 1933, when she was thrown out of medical school, having only two semesters left to do, to complete, her expulsion was for political reasons rather than for being Jewish. So, you know, it was like the day after on April, or whatever it was. Um, her route to Cambridge was far more uncertain and tortuous than my father's. So between 1933 and 1938, she moved around Europe, taking uh, jobs as a research assistant and being supported either by philanthropic uh, groups, refugee groups, or on a tiny wage. So first of all, she was in Antwerp for some time, then in Copenhagen, and later in Turin and she was all the time trying to develop, um, gain skills in tissue culture and organ culture. In between, she had to return to Germany, and she ended up in Basel in 1937, where she decided to complete her medical studies. However, she kept putting off taking her final exams because 
once she'd taken them or been awarded, she would be sent back to Germany immediately. So, um, desperately looking for another job, she eventually got offers from Professor Giuseppe Levy in Turin, whom she'd worked with previously there, who was the, was the father of Natalia Ginsburg, and he's written about quite a lot in that Natalia Ginsburg's family memoir, or whatever it's called. Um, and also from Miss Fell, whom she'd met at a conference in Copenhagen. So luckily, she accepted the latter. And in her memoir, she wrote, I'll just I'll read this out quickly. I could no longer put, a, I should say, I encouraged her to write her memoirs in the late 1980s, when she was in her 80s. So that's what, when I say her memoir, that's what it's from. I could no longer put off receiving the degree of MD, but this made me more very vulnerable. I wrote to Dr. Fell, telling her how urgent it was to find work outside Switzerland, that I had to leave the country very soon, and if not, ran the risk of being deported to Germany. There was no news for over six weeks, and during this time, I was regularly invited by the police to discuss my departure. I've now got the, from the Basel archives all the police documents, and they're very detailed. Um, they did not believe my story of a possible opening in England, but in mid-October, I received a letter from Dr. Fell offering me the post of research assistant. My post will be supported by the SPSL with a grant of £150 per year. It is very hard to describe the feeling of relief I experienced, and I accepted the offer with a deep feeling of gratitude. Four weeks later, I received a labour permit from the British consulate, but there was a condition attached to it. I was not allowed to acquire a British medical qualification. So in November 1938, she arrived in, in Cambridge. Dr. Fell met her at the station, uh, took her to the laboratory and to her new home, which was lodging with an elderly single woman at the end of, of Hills Road. And to Ilza, this house, the garden, the flowers, and Miss Gray's welcome were like heaven, kind of symbolic of her escape from total insecurity to safety. The only problem she mentioned was shivering in the winter because the house had no central heating. Of so that second photo is of her sort of looking quite happy in Cambridge um, before probably the in internment and everything else. Anyway, her settling into her new life was soon disrupted by the war. In June 1940, the Strange Rose Research Laboratory was declared out of bounds for aliens and she had to leave. She wasn't interned, but she stayed with friends in Oxford before returning to Cambridge. And her memoir... Um, confirms the impression I've already given of sort of uh, lively social life. So she says, Cambridge was full of evacuees and it was easy to make new and interesting friends. Walking or cycling along <coughs> King's Parade, you were bound to meet someone you knew. I've left out the K there. Um, and stop for a cup of coffee. Dr. Roughton, and I've put this, this in deliberately because of the talks we had yesterday. Dr. Roughton, a well-known GP, opened her house in Adams Road to newcomers and refugees, and on Sunday evenings had an at-home at which everybody was mo made welcome. We spent nearly every Sunday evening there. It was most enjoyable, although slightly marred by the curfew that meant we had to be home by 11 p.m. Uh, Dr. Roughton also gave hospitality to the Jos family. Kurt Jos was the head of ballet Jos in Germany and had to leave not only because his wife was half Jewish, but because he was politically suspect. He managed to carry on in Cambridge and performed regularly at the Arts Theatre. His best-known ballet was The Green Table, which we heard about yesterday, depicting international capitalists dancing around a green <laughs> base table. So after her return to the um, lab in 1941, she wondered, quotes, whether gaining an English <coughs> degree would bring me closer to my adopted country. Um, Miss Fell was very enthusiastic and encouraged her to try for it. So she registered to do a PhD at uh, Newnham College with Miss Fell as her supervisor. She had to pay her own fees. And students had, I don't know whether they still do, they had to um, live in or sign in overnight for a certain number of nights per term. And um, in her case, my father had to sign the book because they were already married and obviously they were 
she wasn't in college. In 1943, she gained her PhD, but as women PhDs weren't recognised by the university, there was no degree to ceremony and she wasn't allowed to wear a gown. Um, at the end of that year, so 1943, she was elected a Sir Halley Stewart Fellow. This must have been one of these small funds with quite a substantial increase in salary. And that foundation uh, continued to support her until retirement age. So the remaining war years were spent on research and preparing papers for journal publication and brief holidays in Wales and the Lake District places that were considered safe for, uh, to let aliens travel to, but even so they had to get permission from the Cambridge police um, to leave the city. They were deeply worried about the war and followed the progress of Hitler's and the Allies' campaigns quite closely. But she says that after, after Montgomery's victory at El Alamein and the relief of Stalingrad, their spirits rose and they dared hope again <coughs> and make plans for the future. After the end of the war in 1945, Alfred finally agreed to her wish to have a child. So she, my mother had wanted to work as a doctor, but the British regulations wouldn't allow her, wouldn't recognise her degree, and stipulated that she would have to start all over again. So she remained to the end pretty critical of this because she thought that a German medical, medical education was probably far more thorough you know, than an English one was, as her school was a lot more thorough than mine was. It was um, so she gave up that plan and she continued with research and developing techniques of organ and tissue culture. Um, and soon after the war, she started publishing. Uh, it was quite difficult to find some of the early publications, but there's one from 1951 and nine, one from 1958. Um, very unusually for a mother in that epoch, she worked full-time throughout my childhood and I was often the only child in my class whose mother was working outside of the home, which I think may have stimulated my academic interest in women's employment, but um, who knows. She was ambitious and determined and it paid off with many well-known publications on her research, for example, on uh, the effect of smoking on lung cancer and of vitamin A on prostate and bladder cancer. And she collaborated internationally and had very close colleagues in the US, France, and later in Japan. In 1968, she became a fellow of Lucy Cavendish College and the following year was awarded the honorary degree of um, Doctor of Science by Cambridge University. So to conclude, well, I should, I'll just show you, this is um, Strangeways Research Laboratory. They're not brilliant photos. The arrows, um, is this going to, that mouse isn't going to work. Well, the one in the, um, on the, the left-hand photo, on the right, that daemon of fell um, on the right, my mother two places to her left, and my father on the sideways one. And then the second photo, um, Miss Fell is the only woman there, and my father is there again with a pipe in his mouth. Um, so, in conclusion, City of Scholars, yes, but what to say about Cambridge as City of Refuge? Clearly, both my parents owed their lives to being accepted by the Strange Ways Research Laboratory and the support and intervention of Miss Fell and the colleagues the SPSL as well, and the organisations who funded them. And for that, they were eternally grateful. They were fully integrated into the lab. However, the university as such doesn't figure very much in this, in this story. And in the town gown divide, which was very pronounced at that period, or in the you know, early post-war period, I, it may still be, um, they were definitely consigned to the town camp. Um, at least that was how they experienced it, although it was never really a major issue of complaint for them. I mean, it seems to me that the war years were probably an anomaly in this respect, given that the boundaries were blurred by the large number of, of uh, people who were evacuated from LSE and other London universities who were in, in Cambridge. However, they later felt 
that they were not welcomed or not recognised at least by um, the university. And the SRL, as I said, was not part of the university. My mother felt there was very little um, institutional support from Newnham College. Um, and even though she got more recognition from the university later on. My father was always an outsider, not even permitted to take a book out of the university library, and my mother had to do it for him. So the university culture of those times filtered through my parents' experiences and what I picked up, um, seemed quite exclusionary and sort of self-satisfied to, the, to them as outsiders. It seemed that you had to be a fellow of a college to be recognised as worthy of interest and I think they felt that they were always seen as you know funny funny little foreigners really when they spent six months in the USA in 1956 they felt much more comfortable with the more accepting and um, accepting social life and my mother contrasted this in her memoir with the cold emotional climate of Cambridge so it's very much a double-edged story of welcome you know to, Survival, welcome up to a certain point, but never to become one of us, really. So, thank you. Thank you.